Japanese uh, Labor you, government Senator, that will deliver. The time for this debate has expired. Senator Birmingham. Thank you, Mr. President. I seek leave to make a statement uh, regarding shadow ministerial arrangements. Is leave granted? Leave is granted. Thank you, Senator Birmingham. Thank you, President. Uh, President, I advise the Senate that following the resignations of the member for Clare and the member for Aston from the uh, front bench and uh, the parliament respectively, and the Honourable Darren Chester has been appointed Shadow Minister for Regional Education, Shadow Minister for Regional Development and the Shadow Minister for Local Government and Territories. Senator the Honourable Sarah Henderson has been appointed Shadow Minister for Education. The Honourable David Coleman, MP, has been appointed Shadow Minister for Communications and that Dr Anne Webster, MP, has had the role as Assistant Shadow Minister for Regional Health added to her responsibilities. I seek leave to table the revised Shadow Ministry list and representing arrangements and to have them incorporated into Hansard. This leave granted. Leave is granted. Thank I you, thank Senator, Senator Birmingham. We now move to question time, and I call Senator Birmingham. Thank you, President. President, my question is to the Minister representing the Treasurer. Will superannuation account holders affected by Labor's new doubling of the super tax be able to withdraw funds that are above the new threshold without penalty? Good question. Senator Gallagher. Uh, thank you, um, 64, actually. Uh, Madam President. And I welcome the opportunity to talk about Labor's uh, changes to superannuation and well to the— um, Very well supported to the changes that we announced last week, making a modest adjustment to superannuation tax breaks for earnings on balances above $3 million, uh, a change that won't come into effect until after the next election, meaning that uh, for those people who are in the fortunate position, the 0.5 per cent of people who are in the fortunate position to have uh, super balances over $3 million, the changes will not come into effect uh, for another three years, uh, depending, obviously, of where they are up to, uh, what stage they are up to, whether they are below the um, the age where you can withdraw super, um, that will depend. But there is three years before this policy comes into effect, Senator Birmingham. If people want to make arrangements to their to their affairs uh, before that time comes into effect, depending on where they're at uh, in the super cycle, um, then that's a decision that obviously individual superannuation account holders will make. Thank you, Minister. Senator Birmingham, first supplementary. Thanks, President. Uh, President, uh, I asked the minister, given her answer, will Australians who have not reached preservation age by the time this policy takes effect be able to withdraw excess funds from their superannuation accounts that are above Labor's new threshold without penalty. Uh, thank you, Minister. Uh, thank you, Senator Birmingham, Minister. Uh, thank you. Well, you didn't say that in your first question. Um, well, oh, sorry. If you did, I, I didn't hear. It, but prior to um, uh, preservation age, um, well, there is rules about um, withdrawing super prior to preservation age. Uh, as Senator Birmingham well knows. But this is a very modest change to the superannuation system. 0.5 per cent of superannuation uh, of people will be affected. Um, they have, on average, account balances in the order of $5.8 million, which good, that is good for them, obviously. But we are in charge of having to repair a budget that is in structural deficit of $50 billion a year. That is what you left us. We are making very modest changes to begin the hard work of budget repair. This is a very modest change. It affects a, a tiny amount of people compared to the Thank changes you, Minister, the that you brought in in 2016. As Senator Birmingham, second supplementary. Thank you, President. The rules around preservation age the minister refers to limit the ability of Australians to be able to access their own funds. How does the minister justify legally preventing Australians from changing their investment profile when the government is changing the taxes on those investments? despite having made promises not to do so immediately before the last election. Thank you, Senator Birmingham. Minister. Thank you. Because, um, as I said, it's a very small amount of uh, Australians who are affected by this change. It's a very modest change. It's Order. still concessional Order. arrangements. Let us not forget this. It is still concessional arrangements for those who are in the fortunate position, let's remember that the average super balance is in the order of $150,000. Uh, 
Uh, so that's the average of the super balance. So for those that are fortunate to have uh, super balances over and above that, there are still concessional tax arrangements available even with this change. We are making this very modest change to superannuation to help repair the budget that is in structural deficit because of the mess that you left it in. You didn't fund things properly. You didn't fund things uh, in an ongoing basis. You ignored pressures coming to the budget, hoping that someone else would fix it. And that is the work that we are currently doing with this uh, modest thank you, change. Minister. The time for answering has expired. Senator Stewart. President, my question is to the Minister for Finance, Senator Gallagher. Can the minister outline the, to the Senate the challenges facing the budget following a decade of wasteful spending and economic mismanagement under the former coalition government? Thank you, Senator Stewart. Minister. Thank you, President. I thank Senator Stewart for the question. Uh, we inherited, we inherited President. Please continue. Minister. We inherited, uh, President, a budget stuck in structural deficit. Yep. The Liberals and Nationals were the most wasteful government since Federation. Yep. They not only oversaw consecutive budgets riddled with rorts and slush funds, they also failed to deal with the policy challenges and the pressures impacting on the budget, which are now increasing, not decreasing. Not Those opposite delivered more consecutive deficits than Still any government red. since the 1920s. And remember those back in black Still mugs? that were printed yeah, just that little bit yeah, too soon. Yeah. Remember that? We remember yeah. Senator Hume yeah. flashing her back in Order. black mug around. They doubled Order the deficit right. before the pandemic hit. They left us with a trillion dollars in debt with very little to show for it. And they also propped up their budget numbers with a whole range of terminating measures, funding cliffs, and a long list of zombie measures going back to 2016. 2016 that you had those zombie measures there trying to make your budget bottom line look better than it was. We had to spend $4.1 billion in October to resolve some of these legacy issues inherited from the previous government, including providing funding certainty for programs that were underfunded or had expiring funding but were ongoing in nature, such as environmental approval processes. What, how do you know? They continue on the 1st of July in a new financial year. Information technology uh, programs such as modernising business registers. Again, let's have a look at the total price of that program once it's finalised. And this budget, President, we are continuing to do that. We are continuing to find funding cliffs, adult public dental services, MyGov platform, the My Health record, the high risk terror offender program. Not funded. Thank you, Not Minister. Funded. Your time has expired. Senator Stewart, first supplementary. Thank you. Can the Minister provide an update? on the work being done to repair the budget after the mess left behind by the former coalition government. Thank you, Senator Stewart. Minister Gallagher. <laughs> Thank you, President. Yes, indeed. I'll take that interjection from Senator Watt. I am running out of time because there is a list of things here that we are uncovering and we'll continue to work on from October and now into the May um, budget. But we are looking at how we can limit the growth in spending, especially when inflation is high, how we support modest revenue increases for example, this, uh, to support our budget repair, which was the announcement we made last week, and focusing new spending on investments that grow the capacity of the economy, like the National Reconstruction Fund, which the Noalition are opposed to, opposed to manufacturing jobs, opposed to jobs in the region, opposed to Australia getting their fair share of support from a government for those important industries that we're going to rely on in years to come. The October budget also included um, savings, and we will continue to look at sensible savings areas where we can as we commit to the ongoing role of budget repair. Thank you, Minister. Senator Stewart, a second supplementary. Thank you, Minister, for outlining the uh, repair responses that are underway. Can you please uh, update the Senate uh, on why budget repair is crucial to supporting the Australian economy and individuals and businesses? Thank you, Senator Stewart. Minister. Thank you. Well, we must improve the state of our budget. We need to make those responsible decisions that will ensure the budget is able to withstand and respond to future shocks when they come. And they will come. But we have to make room in the budget to repair the mess that we inherited. And we also have to make room for sensible spending for those areas where we're seeing increased pressure for Medicare, for hospitals, for aged care, for the NDIS, for other social services, for 
defence and national security, all of these areas where the pressures on the budget are increasing, they're accelerating, they're not decreasing, and our budget has to be in a position where we are able to, to deal with that. So we will go through and deal with the legacy of um, poor budgeting, the budget vandals that we saw opposite. We will fix up those areas where we can, and we will make room for Australians' priorities in those areas I've just outlined. Thank you, Minister. Senator Hume. Uh, Madam President, my question is to the Minister representing the Treasurer, Senator Gallagher. Minister, how will the government's new doubling of the super tax treat unrealised capital gains? Thank you, uh, Senator Hume. Minister. Thank you. And I I, um, I am surprised that the, those opposite have decided to oppose this modest increase um, in, in, um, or a reduction in, in tax concessions. A modest $2 billion. I know you'd like to flag it as something other than it is, but 0.5 per cent of Australians who are fortunate enough to have balances over $3 million will pay a still a concessional rate of tax at 30 per cent on their earnings in a year, and it will raise $2, million, uh, $2 billion when fully operational in three years' time after we've had another election. But on the, on the question, thank you, Senator Scar, for shouting across the chamber. The simplest, least cost approach is to apply the tax on the growth of an individual's balance over the year. This approach, recommended by Treasury, includes assessing unrealised ca capital gains. It applies prospectively. Alternate approaches would be very costly for super funds, which would come at the expense of members, not just all members, not just those with high balances. Trustees already calculate the value of their fund each year and submit to the tax office. Which, which will enable Order. the ATO to determine liability. We believe this, this approach strikes the right balance between simplicity and ensuring that the tax can be applied Order. across the system to improve the sustainability of this system. And see, this is what's different between when you were in government and we are now in government as the responsible economic and fiscal managers of this budget. You went after robo-debt. You went after people with nothing. You went after people who didn't even owe you money. That's what you did. That was the approach. You knew it was illegal. You went after them. You went after Order. them. They didn't even owe Order. you money. This is a modest change to 0.5 per cent of Australians uh, who have you, a Minister. high the time three has million. Expired. Senator Scar, I haven't called you yet, Senator Hume. Interjections are disorderly and continuing to repeat them and yelling out across the chamber and from the back of the chamber is incredibly disorderly. Senator Hume. Minister, how will the government's new doubling of the super tax apply to a self-funded retiree in the drawdown phase with a self-managed super fund that owns a commercial property that was valued at 2.5 million in 2024-25 and then valued at 3.1 million in 25-26? but they received a commercial rent of 80000 also in that year. Uh, thank you, Senator Hume. Minister Gallagher. Uh, thank you, um, yes. President. And I might take the detail of that question on notice. Well, I mean, if you're, seri oh. if you're serious oh. about an answer right, on that, I can, I can take— if, you, if you're serious about getting an answer Order. on that— I mean, if I'm going to come in here and give individual superannuation advice to individual accounts that are given to me, is that where we're going. It is a modest change. The, the tax will be paid on earnings in a year. Uh, it will be taxed on earnings in a year. The tax office will undertake those assessments, as they currently do. And as Senator uh, Hume knows— Thank you, Minister. Senator Hume. Can I just clarify that answer, please, Madam President? Uh, Senator Hume, why are you on your feet? Do you have I'd, a point of order? Point of order. I'd just like a clarification from the minister. Uh, that's that's a, not a point of order. Thank you, Senator I Hume. I don't understand. Senator Hume, the minister. Senator Hume, this is not a. Please resume your seat. Order on my right. When senators get to their feet to ask a point of order, and I rule it either in order or out of order, that is the end of the matter. It's not an option to continue to argue with me. Minister, please continue. Uh, thank you. Well, I've taken the um, substantive question on notice because of the detail of the question. 
um, and I'm not here to give individual superannuation advice. Uh, well, I'm not. I mean, you, you, you've given me a cameo. I've taken that on notice. I will come back to you. I will come back to you with an answer on it. There are liquidity requirements for those in uh, SMSF. Thank you, Minister. The time for answering has expired. Senator Hume, second supplementary. Can the minister point to any other example of unrealised capital gains being used in the Commonwealth tax system, or indeed in any other jurisdiction? And can you rule out applying taxes to unrealised capital gains elsewhere in the tax system, such as onto the family home or to any other assets currently subject to capital gains tax? Thank you. Senator Hume, Minister. Uh, thank you. Well, we've made clear what the change is. We've been upfront with the Australian people about what that change is, uh, and it, it relates to high income uh, superannuation accounts with. Uh, with more than $3 million in it. That is the government's announcement. So don't try and, don't try and run your, your fear campaign, your scare campaign, saying it's everything other than it is. Saying it is everything other than Order. it is. The Prime Minister Order. has made it clear what the, super and what the changes are and the limit to that, those changes. That was the policy that we announced last year. But it is, last week, sorry. But it is a... Uh, resume but your it is seat. A Minister, modest... please resume your seat. Order on my left and right. Thank you. Uh, Minister, please continue. But this is the hill you're going to die on yeah. after you pursued thousands of Australians you, for robo debt. That is how you tried to repair the budget. That is the hill you're going to die on, is this, while you are the party of robo debt and those vulnerable Thank Australians you, that you harassed. Order. Thank you, Minister. The time has expired. Order on my left. Senator Waters. Thank you very much, President. My question is to the Leader of the Government representing the Minister for Climate Change and Energy. Today, a report was released by Reputex, the modellers who modelled the Labor Party's climate policy for their election. Their report forecasts 56 million tonnes of pollution from just 13 new coal and gas projects. That's an 11 per cent increase on Australia's current emissions. Can you guarantee that the safeguard mechanism will see actual pollution from coal and gas go down, not up? Thank you, uh, Senator Waters, Minister. Uh, thank you, President, and thanks to Senator Waters for her question. And you know, the government uh, uh, has put forward a safeguard mechanism the purpose of which is to provide a predictable and orderly pathway to net zero uh, by 2050 for the 215 biggest emitters in our economy. Uh, and I would make the point, and I understand this is an issue of uh, negotiation and discussion, but this is the only chance that the parliament will have to reduce emissions from all big emitters. Now, the safeguard changes are expected to reduce 250 million tonnes of carbon dioxide emissions to 2030. That is the equivalent of taking uh, two-thirds of Australia's uh, cars off the roads. Uh, so uh, I think that the proposition in the question seems to suggest or imply you know, this is not the way we should go about reducing our emissions. Uh, that, that, that may be the Greens' view. Uh, uh, we don't share it. We, we see benefit. We, 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 we see benefit in a predictable pathway to actually deliver the 2030 and 2050 targets. And uh, in uh, government, Minister, please resume your seat. Senator Waters. Yes, reluctantly. Point of order on relevance. I specifically asked whether actual pollution from coal and gas would go up or down under the safeguard mechanism. There was uh, also a number of other. Uh, there was context before that, and I do believe that the minister is being relevant. But I'll continue to listen carefully. Minister, please continue. Well, I understand that the uh, Greens political party uh, are more interested in particular sectors of the economy and targeting them. Uh, we believe that you're an economy-wide approach based on who are the largest emitters with a predictable pathway to achieving the, uh, the targets. Senator Wish-Wilson, would you like to stand up and give a speech? Uh, Senator Wish-Wilson, please come to order. Minister, please continue. If he wants to ask and answer his own questions, he's got opportunities to do that. But I'm trying to answer. 
Uh, Senator Wish Wilson, I've just called you to order and I have the minister on her feet. Minister, please continue. Leader, apparently, too. No, I, I agree with you. He can't. I agree. Um, the, the, the point we make is that uh, an economy-wide predictable pathway is the, is the lowest cost way for Thank us you, to Minister. The time for answering has expired. On. Senator Waters, first supplementary. Thanks very much, uh, President. These new coal and gas projects could force industries that can actually adapt and survive in a net zero world, like cement, steel and aluminium, to have to cut more pollution. Uh, by almost double. Why is your climate policy pushing the costs of new coal and gas onto everyone else? Good uh, thank you, Senator Waters. Minister. I, I don't accept the characterisation. Uh, this is a mechanism which is about making sure the largest emitters have a pathway to contribute to net zero by 2050. Uh, and I know that uh, you know, there are those who would like uh, governments to pick and choose sectors. Uh, uh, in terms of making a contribution, I know that you know there's a particular political political views that the Greens political party have on these issues. Uh, we think the best approach is to ta is to ensure that the market can see a predictable pathway to achieving these reductions, because it's all very well to talk about targets, but the, the most important thing is to have policy mechanisms which actually order. Uh, Senator Wish Wilson, I've just called you to order. Uh, Minister, please continue. Minister Wong, I've called you back to continue answering the question. If you have anything further to uh, add, I, 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 the point I'm making is we want we want a mechanism that actually ensures these targets are delivered, because there's no point in talking about action on climate change if we can't deliver it. And we are determined to deliver it, something that this country has not been able to do because of the attitude of those Thank opposite you, for too the many years. The time has expired. Senator Waters, second supplementary. Thank you, President. These 13 new coal and gas projects would see coal and gas pollution rise in the critical decade for climate action. And there is another 100 new proposals for coal and gas in the pipeline. Why does Labor want to open more coal and gas in the middle of a climate crisis? Uh, Minister. Uh, as I explained, the safeguard mechanism will target 205 million tonnes of net emissions reductions to 2030 overall Order. through the safeguard. It is, it is correct we are not looking to pick one sector over another. If you emit in excess of 100,000 carbon dioxide tonnes of carbon dioxide a year, you will be covered. Uh, so it's agnostic in the sense of where, where the emissions occur, other Order. than to say, if you're a big emitter, you should have a pathway to reducing your emissions. Now, I would have thought that those, that those at the end of the chamber might actually think it's a good thing to get those industries that, and, and individual firms who are emitting a very large amount of carbon dioxide into the atmosphere to reduce their emissions so we can all meet the net zero target that everybody uh, with, uh, with some exceptions that most of this chamber have signed up to. Uh, thank you. Senator Still. Order. Senator Still. Thanks, President. My question is to the Minister uh, representing the Minister for Industry and Science, Senator Farrell. Can the Minister update the Senate on the government's plans to ensure that Australia adds value to our critical minerals like lithium, nickel, cobalt? Manganese, sorry, manganese, and rare earths that we mine in that fantastic part of the nation, WA, and develops a domestic battery manufacturing capability. Minister, what are the opportunities for Australia from developing a domestic industry? Thank you, Senator Stirl. Minister Farrell. Uh, thank you, uh, President. And uh, can I thank uh, Senator Stirl for that very insightful question? And I know for his support of the mining uh, industry generally in uh, in West Australia, but in particularly. In particular, this uh, area of critical minerals, of course, um, the cabinet was up your way last week at uh, Port Hedland. First time ever, first time ever a cabinet been into uh, that part of uh, beautiful Western Australia. But uh, as senators are no doubt aware, Australia is rich in a number of the critical minerals on which the renewable energy economy will be based. We're very good at extracting minerals but we've not always been good at capturing their true value. And that's what this government is trying to change, uh, <laughs> Senator Stirl. 
If we look at lithium batteries, the global market for minerals will grow from a current $2 billion to $11 billion by 2035. But if we take one more step up the value chain and refine those minerals, that market grows from $2 billion to $44 billion, some 22 times larger. Then, if we take it all the way to manufacturing the battery cells, that market, listen to this, uh, Senator uh, Stirl, that market will grow from $31 billion to $387 billion. How many? How many? I'll, I'll repeat that for you, um, Senator uh, uh, Watt. Uh, that market will grow from $31 billion to $387 billion. And battery pack assembly will then grow Battery pack assembly. Remember, this is the mob over here who closed down Holden's. Right. Uh, battery pack assembly will grow from $156 billion to $1.1 trillion. They don't, they don't like Madam President, if we mine it here, Order. if we mine it here, we should make it here. Thank you, Minister. Your time has expired. Senator Searle, first supplementary. Thank you, President. I am absolutely in awe, Minister. Other than our access to critical minerals, what other advantage does Australia have when it comes to developing a domestic battery industry? Thank you, Senator Stirl. Minister Farrell. Thank you, President, and thank uh, Senator Stirl again for his extremely insightful question once again. Um, the resources that Australia has been blessed with um, are human as well as mineral. Across Australia, there are scientists, researchers, uh, business leaders who are leading the world when it comes to battery technology. From the Future Battery Industry CRC at Curtin University to the National Battery Testing Centre at QUT, we're at the cutting edge of this technology. Modern batteries are built uh, not just on smart chemistry, but smart technology as well, uh, and this is a vital capacity that we must foster and your state of Western Australia is leading the way in that regard. Senator Searle, second supplementary. What is the government doing, Minister, to make sure that we can take advantage of these opportunities and provide jobs in our regions and in our suburbs? Uh, Minister Farrell. Well, I, I, couldn't agree, I couldn't agree more. That is an extremely insightful uh, question. And uh, I have an answer for you, uh, Senator Searle. Uh, and the National Battery Strategy is our government's plan to build a battery manufacturing industry. We're not closing down <coughs> industries like you did with, uh, with Holden's. We're building it up. This strategy will ensure that we capture the true value of our natural resources and put our international capital to work delivering products that will be in high demand right around the world and support the global transition to net zero. If we mine here, we should make it here, because that will deliver high skill, high wage jobs, uh, not only in the cities, but particularly in the regions and the suburbs right around Australia. Thank you, Minister. Senator Roberts. Thank you, President. My question is to the minister representing the Minister for Health, Senator Gallagher. In February Senate estimates hearings, Adjunct Professor Skerritt, Deputy Secretary Health Products Regulation Group, made the following statement, and I quote, there is only one regulator in the world, the US FDA, that actually looks at individual patient data. The rest of the regulators, like us, take statistically validated analyses of patient data. If there are issues with the individual patient data, the FDA will raise those issues. We do not get, in, we do not get individual patient data, end of quote. In estimates hearings on the 10th of November 2022, Professor Skerritt said, quote, we did check the phase two and phase three clinical trial data from Pfizer. Minister, please confirm that the TGA simply checked what Pfizer and the FDA sent to them without checking that back to the source material, patient records, meaning they took Pfizer's word for it. Thank you, Senator Roberts. Minister Gallagher. <laughs> Uh, thank you, President, and um, I thank Senator Roberts for his question. And I was there at I think both of those hearings uh, with Professor Skerritt, um, who has 
has since um, retired from that role, and I just take this opportunity to acknowledge his contribution, uh, particularly during the COVID-19 pandemic um, and the role of the TGA. Um, I on the on the substantive part of your question, Senator Roberts, I will go back. I because I I obviously wasn't in in um, position I'm in now when those comments were made um, about what was done with the phase one and phase two trials and the data that was available. But my understanding of the TGA processes is they don't just um, necessarily look at one set of data. They are looking at a whole range of data as they're making approvals for uh, particular uh, vaccines. But I will come back and, and if I have anything further to add on that. Um, I would also say that uh, it's very clear that uh, the vaccination program, uh, the, success, you know, the rollout of the vaccination program has saved lives and it has, particularly for those who are vulnerable uh, to COVID-19, um, reduced the chance that they would pass away or have very severe uh, disease from COVID-19. And that data is well and truly established and evidence-based. And you can see that in um, the hospitalisations data, um, and other data that's collected about the impact of the vaccination program. So the vaccine program has been very successful and we're very fortunate to have been in a position, I think, to have all been vaccinated against this uh, virus over the last couple of years. Thank you, Minister. Senator Roberts, first supplementary. Thank you. Minister, can you assure the Senate that the US FDA did actually check the Pfizer analysis of patient data back to the actual patient data? Thank you, Senator Roberts. Minister Gallagher. Well, I don't think I'm in a position or the government's in a position to, um, to say what the um, FDA did or didn't do. Um, I can certainly see if there's any further information I can provide uh, to the senator. I acknowledge his ongoing interest in this area. Um, and if there are f uh, further advice I can provide to assure you that um, very strong and thorough and rigorous processes were followed before the TGA approved uh, any of the vaccines that were use, used to vaccinate against COVID-19. Thank you, Minister. Senator Roberts, second supplementary. If that is the case, Minister, why then does that same data, when independent leading virologists examine it properly in a peer-reviewed published paper, show the 400,000 patient records actually prove the vaccine was unsafe and should not have been approved? I ask you again, Minister, did our bureaucrats approve a dangerous product because they trusted Pfizer and in so doing, they failed to act in Australia's best interests. Thank you, Senator Roberts. Minister uh, Gallagher. Thank you. Well, no, no, I don't think that's a cor correct assertion to put. And I do have, and I would expect uh, that most senators in this place uh, would have complete and total faith in the processes used by the TGA when they were going through the approvals for the vaccine against COVID-19. I know there are some in this place, and I've, I've certainly sat in estimates uh, listening to the questions that a number of senators have asked that have a different view. But I would say the overwhelming view of senators in this place is that the TGA undertook rigorous examination in a compressed time frame because of the situation we were facing. And I think it's easy to forget that we were facing a pandemic where it was predicted that we would see significant loss of life if we were not able to protect citizens. And we've been, again, very fortunate to have relied on the science to have rolled out the vaccine. And the data is very clear around the, le the impact the vaccines had on reducing serious disease and death from COVID-19. Thank you, Minister. The time has expired. Senator Askew. Thank you. My question is to the Minister representing the Treasurer, Senator Gallagher. Given Labor's new doubling of the super tax, we'll see earnings in some superannuation accounts paying twice the tax rate as currently applies. Will there be any changes to the tax rates applied to those accounts when they are distributed following an account holder's death? Good question. Thank you, Senator Askew. Minister Gallagher. Uh, thank you. And uh, I welcome the opportunity to um, talk about the government's policy, which, well, I would I will answer the question, so hold your horses. Um, no, I'm not wasting time here. It's an important question, and I'm making sure that I get the answer exactly correct for you. Um, well, I do my homework, Senator Scar. Um, 
I do my homework. But I welcome the opportunity to talk about this very modest change that we are making to the, um, to the arrangements for uh, superannuation for those on uh, higher incomes, $3 million or more, uh, raising a modest uh, $2 billion once fully operational in, in three years' time. Uh, and I would make the point that those opposite have failed to, to understand is that at the moment the budget is in structural deficit. We are borrowing to keep services going, okay? And we are saying that it's not fair Order. To, to borrow more. Please resume your seat. Please resume your seat, uh, Senator Askew. Just a point of relevance, uh, point of order on relevance. I did ask about the specifically in the case of death. Thank you. I'll direct the uh, minister to the question. Thank you. But just to finish that point, I will come to the to the issue that was raised by Senator Askew. Is that Senator Askew and those opposite the Noalition are arguing that others with much lower superannuation balances should be paying the interest on the debt that we are borrowing to keep the services of government going, rather than make this modest change. For those that are fortunate enough to have three million and more in their accounts, an average of 5.8 million, generally death benefits are able to be withdrawn from the superannuation system. Members will have this option, so they do not face additional tax. Uh, thank you, Minister. Senator Askew, first supplementary. Thank you. Will Labor's new doubling of the super tax mean that a widow or widower? would be penalised with a higher tax rate if the retention of their late spouse's superannuation within superannuation saw their savings now exceed Labor's new and unindexed threshold? Uh, thank you, Senator Askew. Minister. Uh, the death benefit will not count as earnings in the year that it is received by the surviving spouse. Uh, Senator Askew, second supplementary. Okay. So how is the application on deceased estates of Labor's new doubling of the super tax, which Mr Albanese promised not to do, anything other than a creeping march towards new forms of death duties that penalise Australians at their most vulnerable time? Order. 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 Order across the chamber. I have the minister on her feet waiting to answer the question. Order on my right. Order. Senator Wong. Minister. Thank you. Classic example there of not being able to amend your final question based on the answers to the first two. I would say, I would say for those that are arguing to maintain these arrangements, these concessional arrangements, which will remain concessional for the 0.5% who are fortunate enough uh, to have Ruffin. more than three million in their superannuation account to contribute or to have less concessional arrangements in place that contributes to budget repair. And that 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 is your core group now. The 0.5 per cent who have who are in that back. And when we have a look, when we have a look, just remember those words. Remember the words of RoboDebt. We will find you. We will track you down, and you will have to repay those debts, and you may end up in prison. You may end up in prison. That is the approach you took to budget repair. That is the approach. Thank you, Minister. Senator Rice. Mr. President, my question is to the Minister for Finance, Senator Gallagher. Minister, on the 21st of February, the Fair Work Commission said that the 15 per cent increase for aged care workers should be paid in full from 1 July 2023. Minister, will the Commonwealth commit to funding that 15 per cent increase in full from 1 July 2023, and will that include on costs such as funding for leave and superannuation? Uh, thank you, Senator Rice. Minister. Uh, the government has said that we will fund that aged care case, and I think again, and thank you, Senator uh, Rice, for the opportunity to again contrast the, the approach that we're taking as in government, as opposed to them, uh, when they were in, where they pursued vulnerable, um, low-income Australians and threatened them with prison for an illegal scheme that they knew was illegal. That's right, they down. That is the approach. They down. We are making room in our budget to fund priorities like aged care wages. We had asked for a phased-in approach, um, just again to smooth um, our budget situation because of the impact. It's uh, the the cost to the budget is. Uh, in a multi-billion dollars. Um, we've made some provision for that. We'll have a look at how much we have to adjust that 
uh, for the budget going forward. But we, yes, we have said we will fully fund it because we value the work of aged care workers. We understand they are underpaid, and unlike those opposite, whose deliberate design feature of their economic architecture was keeping wages suppressed, uh, we do believe that those are on low wages, um, like aged care and other workers, deserve the support of their government. Uh, and you will see a significant commitment in this budget um, to go to fund the costs of that case. Thank you, Minister Gallagher. Senator Rice, first supplementary. Thanks, um, Minister. And look, I just want clarification that when you say you will fully fund it, you are now talking about fully funding it in that first financial year, not spreading it out over two financial years as um, originally proposed. I mean, that's good news. So I'm wondering whether you would be actually willing to go further, because the Health Services Union, of course, had asked, called for a 25 per cent increase in wages. And as we know, the aged care workforce is really low paid. Why would the government continue with the stage three tax cuts rather than fund the full amount that aged care workers really need? Thank you, uh, Senator Rice. Minister Gallagher. Thank you. Um, and I thank Senator Rice for the question. Uh, there is a further stage to the Fair Work Commission case. Um, this is just this is, I think, the culmination of stages one and two on the aged care case that has come up uh, with this um, the initial uh, increase of 15 per cent. That was the stage one decision. Stage two has come back saying that we that the Commission thinks it should be paid on uh, the 1st of July and to include some other workers in that um, arrangement. Uh, and now there's a subsequent process uh, to consider the rest of the case. Um, we I think you can see from the commitments we've made to date and the room that I'm currently trying to find in the budget to fund this, while against these crazy attacks uh, from the opposition who prefer a head in their sand approach to uh, funding aged care things like I don't fund them or argue against them, uh, we are making the, the difficult decisions to be able to fund uh, aged care Thank workers you, appropriately. Uh, Senator Rice, second supplementary. Thank you. Thanks, Minister. I mean, the Royal Commission estimated that implementing their recommendations in full would cost on the order of $10 billion a year annually. And the latest official figures show that aged care providers are operating at an average loss of $28 per resident per day. So in terms of finding room in the budget, abandoning the stage three tax cuts would free up an extra $25 billion per year on average. So will the government find room in the budget by you, abandoning Rice. the Your Scott Morrison tax cut? Minister Gallagher. Uh, thank you. Well, in answer to that question, our policy on those tax cuts haven't changed. Um, we are focused on making sure multinationals can pay their fair share of tax, and uh, of course, uh, we'll look to uh, legislate uh, the arrangements for uh, the superannuation changes that we announced last week. Um, so that they are the areas that we have been focused on. Um, but we are also going through the budget line by line. It is my job and the Treasurer's job and the ERC's job to look at ways that we can make room for all of the priorities and for all of the services that the Australian people value. We know they value aged care. We know they value Medicare. We know they value um, hospital care. And um, you know that that is the difficult job, and it requires at times some difficult decisions. But we are responsible. We are fiscally responsible. We are dealing with the decade of um, budget vandalism that went on uh, over. Um, from those opposite, and Thank we are you, making Minister, those difficult decisions. Expired. Senator Grogan. Uh, my question is to the minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Wong. Can the minister update the Senate on how the Albanese government is delivering a better future for all Australians after a decade of failed policies? Thank you, Senator Grogan. Minister. Thank you very much to Senator Grogan from my own wonderful state that I haven't got to see in a little while uh, of South Australia. I appreciate the question, and I'm very pleased to uh, in talk to the Senate about what this government is seeking to do after a decade of division, of denial, of waste and rorts, secret ministries and yep. deliberate neglect, well? uh, uh, which went so well, uh, about what the Albanese government is delivering. This government, since the election, has supported a, an increase in the minimum wage and secured a pay rise for aged care workers. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I just want to remind everybody, after the many questions which Senator Gallagher has answered so well, that just recall that those opposite 
desperately opposed a dollar per hour for the That's lowest right. paid workers in Australia, right. but they are prepared to go to the wall right. over 0.5 per cent of yeah. pe people in Australia who have $3 million in their superannuation yeah. accounts. And Australians will look at that and they will understand which side of this chamber is actually about Sorry. families and working people, Sorry. which side of this chamber Sorry. is actually about a better future for all Australians, and yep. which side are, are too busy focusing on scare campaigns such as the, some of the pathetic attempts of those opposite. This government has made childcare cheaper. We've made medicines cheaper. We've created 180,000 new fee-free TAFE places. That we've delivered 20,000 university places. Established 10 days paid to the family and domestic violence leave. The government is expanding paid parental leave. The government is acting to make workplaces safe from sexual harassment with the passage of the Respect at Work Bill. We've established Jobs and Skills Australia. We've passed a historic climate change bill and updated our climate targets. We are repairing our international relations and making Australia stronger and more influential in the world. We have expanded the Commonwealth Seniors Health Card and made it easier for pensioners to earn more without losing their pension. We have invested in affordable housing and we have delivered Minister, the first home buyers guarantee. Thank you, Minister. Your time has expired. Senator Grogan, first supplementary. Thank you, Minister. That's an impressive list of items that you have run through there, and it's very pleasing to see. Um, I wonder if you could now tell us how these achievements are going to ease the cost of living for Australians. Minister Wong. Thank you, uh, uh, Senator Grogan. Well, the, the, this government and the senators on this side understand that it's important that government actually put in place measures to help address the cost of living challenges created under the Liberals and the Nationals. And let's just remember that those opposite presided over increases to out-of-pocket childcare costs of 47 per cent. Yep. Let's remember those opposite who wanted to introduce a GP tax, yep. tried to increase the cost of medicines by five dollars. Uh, opposed, never increased the number of paid parental leave weeks, said no to social and affordable housing, including for women and children, yep. uh, and, as I said before, most importantly, opposed a dollar an hour. Unbelievable. Increase to the minimum wage for the lowest paid in our country. Everyone will remember the way in which those opposite refused to back that wage increase and which leader was prepared to stand up and say, I Thank back Thank you, it. Minister. Your time has expired. Senator Grogan, uh, second supplementary. Thank you very much. Um, I wonder if you could now step out for us how the Albanese government will continue to deliver for Australians this year. Minister. Thank you, uh, Senator Grogan, for the second supplementary. Well, we, we know we can't fix a decade of neglect, incompetence and bad policies overnight, but we will keep working to deliver on our commitments to provide greater economic security, relief for families, security in energy, manufacturing, jobs and wages. And those opposite, as much as they yell, as much as they yell, everyone will remember who is the party that voted against energy price relief? Yeah. Who is the party that doesn't want to support manufacturing in this country? Oh, the reality Order. is those opposite, Order. those opposite have no plan, Order. no plan Senator to address Cow. cost of living, no Senator plan Hughes. to address the future. And what we've seen in this question time already, Order. already, is that they have Senator not learned Hume. from a decade of division and pathetic scare campaigns. But if they think that that is what Australians are after now, I have a message Senator to them: McKenzie. we are about building a better future for Australians, and that's Thank what Australians you, Minister, want. Your time has expired. Senators, when you are called to order, specifically when I call you by name, I expect you to stop interjecting. Uh, Senator Bragg. Oh, thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, President, for that. Uh, my question is to the Minister representing the Treasurer, Senator, Senator Gallagher. Watt. And uh, my question is: how will the new super tax apply to defined benefit schemes? Thank you, Senator. Bragg, um, Minister. Thank you. From, uh, from the senator that uh, so positive about super, <laughs> so positive about super, who has a long lifelong interest in super. Yeah, I will. And we're doing it exactly the same way that you did it when you announced your um, your 2016 changes. 
there are a couple of areas that we need to consult upon um, further, uh, which we will do. Um, but there isn't, uh, because of the nature of, of um, defined benefit, that we will, they will be included in the scheme, and we announced that when we announced the measure, and our and our announcement accounted for that. Um, it was clear, and again in the announcement by the treasurer, that we would consult with the sector, which is the same process because I remember it when you introduced it in your 2016, 20, 2017 changes, which of course went much further than the changes that we are talking about today. So um, we expect that the changes um, will, well, they definitely will cover defined benefits scheme, and there are a couple of areas that we are going to consult on. Um, and we want Hearing. some industry advice on. As people know, that the um, defined benefit schemes work differently to accumulation schemes, and they are complex. Uh, and so there is some uh, further consultations we would like to do, as as the Morrison government did back in 2016, 2017. Yeah. Thank you, Minister. Senator Bragg's first supplementary. Oh, thanks very much uh, for that, Minister. Uh, can you guarantee that there will be equitable treatment between? the ordinary superannuation schemes and the generous defined benefit schemes. Thank you, Senator Bragg. Minister Gallagher. Uh, thank you. Well, we are including them in the, um, in, under the same arrangements. So yes, they will be treated equitably. Um, and we, as I said, there are two areas where we will like to consult industry on. The valuation of a defined benefit scheme for the purposes of assessing a person's superannuation balance against the $3 million threshold and um, approach to taxing the equivalent of earnings in relation to balances above $3 million. We will consult closely with funds that have defined benefit schemes on this. Um, this is exactly the same arrangements that you put in place when you lowered uh, the 300,000 Division 293 um, threshold to 250,000. When you made those changes, which weren't indexed, by the way, just throw that in. Um, when you put those arrangements in place, you also undertook a process around defined benefits scheme. We are doing exactly the same thing. Thank you, Minister. Senator Bragg, second supplementary. Thanks. Thanks very much. Minister, did the five cabinet ministers, including the Prime Minister, who will have access to generous defined benefit schemes, declare their personal interest before or during the cabinet deliberation on Labor's new doubling of the super tax? Uh, thank you, Senator Bragg. Minister. Uh, all, uh, the cabinet handbook uh, was followed, and I can assure the senator uh, we are an orderly, adult, responsible government. We take th we take matters of integrity and honesty very seriously. Um, we don't introduce illegal schemes like robo-debt, which pursued vulnerable people in the name of budget repair. Remember that? It was going to raise $4 billion and repair the budget. What you didn't say was it's illegal. We're going to hound vulnerable people that don't owe us money. We're going to threaten to send them yeah, to jail. We're going to threaten to send them to jail. That's what happened over here. We are not that type of government. All, all arrangements, as set out in the Cabinet Handbook, including declarations of relevant conflicts, are done uh, are followed in accordance with those arrangements. Thank you, Minister. Senator Sheldon. Thank you. Good time. My question is to the Minister for Emergency uh, Management, Senator Watt. Last February, New South Wales and Queensland faced devastating flooding in one of the uh, costliest and most devastating global natural disasters of 2022. As we pass the one-year anniversary, can the Minister please update the Senate on what support has been provided to these very important communities? Thank you, Senator Sheldon. Minister Watt. Uh, thank you, President, and thank you, Senator Sheldon, for your ongoing work uh, as the government's disaster envoy, as well envoy for disaster recovery, uh, supporting me and all flood victims uh, in the ongoing task of recovery. Uh, I'd, of course, like to acknowledge again uh, that this one-year anniversary has been a very difficult time for many Australians. The flooding event that we saw in February 2022 devastated communities across the east coast of Australia and it has been and will be a long road towards recovery. As a government, we've been working very hard, along with those affected communities in New South Wales and Queensland, to ensure that they are able to not just recover 
from those floods back in February last year, but to build back in a more resilient way. Financial recovery that's now been provided totals in the billions of dollars for a range of programs across a range of floods last year, and those programs assist primary producers, small businesses, homeowners, charities, landlords, councils and many others. In the Northern Rivers of New South Wales alone, more than $1 billion has been provided jointly with the New South Wales Government in support payments directly to residents, but we know that there's a long way yet to go. While the Albanese government is focused on recovery, we're also focused on being better prepared for future disasters. That's why we've rolled out resilience and betterment projects in disaster-prone regions, passed legislation and opened applications for our flagship Disaster Ready Fund, unified the two arms of federal emergency management to create a new national emergency management agency, provided pathways out of harm's way for people through investment in voluntary home buybacks and taking action on future floodplain builds, We've invested in Disaster Relief Australia to provide recovery and clean-up support after disasters. We've commissioned an independent review into national disaster funding arrangements to ensure funding is hitting the right areas. We've invested in flood research and many other things. The Albanese government knows that the job is not over and will continue to support communities impacting by natural disasters. Thank you, Minister. Senator Sheldon, first supplementary. In my home state of New South Wales, the Northern Rivers was particularly hard hit. What is the Albanese government doing to ensure the Northern Rivers are being prepared for the future flooding? Thank you, Senator Sheldon. Minister Watt. Uh, thank you again, Senator Sheldon. Uh, the 2022 February floods were the worst floods the Northern Rivers has ever seen. Uh, and I know Senator McAllister has also spent a significant amount of time uh, there hailing from the Northern Rivers of New South Wales. Last week I was back in Lismore with local state member Janelle Saffin, Mayor Steve Krieg, Senator Sheldon, Senator McKenzie and the federal member Mr Hogan to commemorate the one-year anniversary and reflect on the past 12 months. I was honoured to meet and thank locals in the Tinney Army as they were presented with medals for their courageous efforts helping to rescue strangers trapped by floodwaters. Recently, I announced $50 million of flood resilience projects to be delivered under Tranche 1 of the Northern Rivers Recovery and Resilience Program, fully funded by the Albanese government. This includes things like road raising, flood pumps, drains and community resilience projects. And the remaining $100 million of projects will be announced within the next six months, but we know that more support will be needed. We're also cost-sharing two major resilience programs, including the Resilient Homes Program and the Regional Thank Roads you, and Minister. Transport the Recovery time has Package. Expired. Senator Sheldon, second supplementary. Uh, right now, communities in the Northern Territory are facing flooding. Can the minister please provide an update on what support has been provided to assist these important communities? Minister. I thank Senator Sheldon for the question. Uh, the Albanese government has acted swiftly to support the Northern Territory through multiple dangerous weather events already this year. Uh, we were there after Tropical Cyclone Ellie and we're there again now. On Wednesday evening last week, I approved a request for Australian Defence Force support from the Northern Territory government, and that support includes three aircraft to assist with the evacuation of residents from remote Indigenous communities. I'd like to thank the personnel involved for their proactive and fast action. I understand that around 570 people are currently residing in Howard Springs, uh, having been evacuated from those communities. We know there's heavy rainfall forecast in these communities for the next week, and so it may be some time before impact assessments can be undertaken and people return to their communities. A liaison officer from the National Emergency Management Agency is on the ground and we remain in close contact with the Northern Territory Government. And that's in addition to Services Australia personnel being based out of Howard Springs. We'll continue to work with the New South Northern Thank Territory you, Government to ensure Senator people Canavan. get um, Madam President, uh, my question is to the Minister representing the Treasurer, Senator Gallagher. Will an increasing number of Australians be subjected to Labor's new doubling of the super tax due to the government's refusal to index its new threshold? Uh, Minister. Uh, thank you, uh, President. I welcome the question on the government's modest change to the superannuation arrangements that uh, we announced last week. Uh, uh, for the thank you very much for the opportunity, because it is important that we explain it. Uh, and the $3 million threshold strikes the right balance between incentives to stay, save for retirement and strengthening the super system by making it more sustainable over time. I think the evidence is uh, from the superannuation sector themselves that 
Uh, ASFA estimates for a comfortable re retirement at 67, you need 545,000 if you're a single person and 640,000 if you are a couple. Um, a $3 million balance will be more than sufficient for an adequate retirement for most people for many years to come. And many parts of the tax system aren't indexed, for example, personal income tax levels and, as I said, the former government lowered the contribution tax threshold, Division 293, Minister, without indexation. Thank you. Uh, Senator Canavan. Point of order on relevance. It was a very simple question about indexing the threshold. The minister hasn't got anywhere near that topic uh, um, the, after the a minute. Min uh, Senator Wong. Uh, uh, as the senator got to his feet to enter to uh, raise the point of order, the senator minister was in fact talking about precisely that. Uh, thank so you. So I think there is minister no point Wong. of order. The, the senator has uh, gone to the issue of your question, Senator Canavan, and I'll continue to listen carefully, Minister. Uh, thank you, um, President. Um, in 30 years, Treasury projects that roughly only the top 10 per cent of earners will retire with superannuation balances of around three million or more. In 30 years, in, in 30 years, in 30 years' time, uh, that that only uh, that that is the estimation of Treasury, and I would say that this this is this is Order. a modest change Order. to 0.5 per cent of people that are coming in of the 80,000 affected. Uh, the average balance is 5.8 million dollars, and I would say again, this is a modest change we are making in response to having to deal with the budget repair that is required from the economic vandalism of your decade in government. Uh, Senator Canavan, first supplementary. Uh, thank you, Madam President. Um, given the government obviously has done modelling, why didn't you tell the Australian people last week that in fact 10 per cent of Australians could be affected by your change, not the modest half per cent you're, you're telling lies about today? Our Minister. In 30 years' time, in 30 years' time, Senator Canavan, and Minister, please resume your seat. Order, order, order. Thank you, Senator Ayres. When I call order, that's what I expect. At the same on my left, Senator Mackenzie. Minister, please continue. Thank you. As I answered the question earlier. Many parts of the taxation system aren't indexed. The income tax thresholds aren't indexed. The Division 293 threshold, which you set, which affected a lot more people, uh, isn't indexed. Now, we are being very upfront with we are being very upfront about the policy that we took, that we announced last week. We are being very clear about it. It affects a very small amount of people in this country. 18 million people are unaffected. Listen to it. It raises a very modest amount by tightening a concession that remains concessional for those who are fortunate enough to have three million. And I would say this to you. The average Australian has 150,000 in their superannuation Thank you, Minister. account. The time so how about you think about them? For has expired. Uh, thank you, Senator Hume. I have Senator Canavan on his feet. Second supplementary. Thank you, Madam President. Given the government has revealed this secret modelling today, how much extra tax, on average, will those 10 per cent of Australians pay over their lifetime because of your doubling of the super tax? Thank you, Senator Canavan. Minister. Yeah. It's a concessional rate of tax. Let's not forget this, that for those fortunate to have three million or more in their superannuation account, mindful of the fact, mindful of the fact that, uh, that the estimates are you need in the order of five hundred to six hundred thousand for a decent retirement, and mindful of the fact that average Australians have 150,000 in their super. How about you have the same level of concern for them? How about Senator you have a, the same level of concern for them as you are feigning at this point in time? Uh, Minister, please resume I've, your seat. Senator, I've got Senator Canavan on his. Well, I need to hit Senator Wong. Please resume your seat. I need to hear the senator first. Oh. <laughs> Whoa! Order! You're doing a great Order. job. Just a moment. 
Order. Order on my left. Order on my left. Order on my left. I have Senator Birmingham on his feet. Senator Birmingham. Pre President, 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 on a point of order and in defence of your position as President, Senator Wong is the first in this chamber to ask for respect to be shown to you Correct. as chair. You said, while Senator Wong was attempting to make her statement, that you had to give the call to Senator Canavan because he was on his feet with a point of order first, and yet Senator Wong chose to ignore what you had said, President, and move ahead with her motion. I ask you to call the point of order, please, President. Uh, thank you, uh, Senator Birmingham. Senator Wong? Madam President, Madam President, I'm in your hands. I thought you were calling me. Uh, and I, Senator, sen order, order, order. Order. I thought you were calling me because of the precedence issue, and I, I understood that Senator Gallagher had finished, so that he is not entitled. Senator Canavan is not entitled to take a point of order after the minister has finished. Um, Senator Wong, I saw. Uh, I'm not sure whether the minister had uh, finished, but I did see Senator Canavan on his feet. I did go to him, and then you stood. But I will seek advice on where we're up to. Uh, Senator Canavan, I am going to go to your point of order. Okay. So um, the point of order was on relevance. Uh, uh, the question uh, only went to the average extra tax paid for by the secret modelling that Labor has done. And in the 36 seconds the minister was speaking, there was not even an attempt to answer that question. Uh, thank you, Senator Canavan. The minister has been expansive in her answers, and I believe she was being relevant. Senator Wong. Yeah. I ask that further questions be placed on notice. Senator Chandler. Mr Deputy President, I move that the Senate take note of answers provided by government ministers in response to questions asked by senators from the opposition during question time today. Um, well, another day, another broken promise. After both the Prime Minister and the Treasurer have consistently assured Australians that they wouldn't make changes to superannuation during the election campaign just last year. Last week, we saw the government confirm that it will be increasing taxes on the savings of an ever-increasing number of Australians. They have deliberately chosen to do this in a way that means each and every year more and more Australians will be hit by these tax increases in the years and decades ahead. The mixed messages the government are pushing with this change are extraordinary, as were the responses that were provided to questions asked by the opposition in question time today. The point of superannuation was supposed to be to ensure that people can be self-sufficient in their retirement, making sure that they aren't reliant on the aged pension. But now the government is saying to people that when you've worked for 50 years and had 11 per cent of your wage taken away every year and put into superannuation, well, that just makes you rich. So the Labor government is going to take a bigger handful of that money to prop up their own budget line. Does the Labor Party want people to fund their own retirement? or punish them for doing so. As the years go on and more and more people will be captured by this tax grab, small business owners, teachers and public servants, why would people trust the superannuation system in the future when they can just see that this government over here will be using it as a big pot of money just waiting to be raided? Well, not even 12 months into this government, Mr Deputy President, and Labor's broken promises are starting to pile up. We have seen Labor backtrack on a number of major policy announcements since the election, most notably their pledge to save Australians an average of $275 on their power bills. Labor was adamant that they were going to pass this savings on to households, but only a few months on from their guarantee, they were forced to admit that the only thing they could guarantee Australians in relation to electricity prices is that households could expect to see power bills go up. And after promising that Labor will cut the cost of living 
instead of this, cost of living is going through the roof. Hardworking Australian families are having to spend more and more of their income on groceries and energy bills and mortgage payments and rent. It is clear to anyone paying attention that Labor told Australians what they, wanted to, what they thought they wanted to hear to win an election, and now they are desperately trying to find excuses to break the promises that they made. You can guarantee that Labor's broken, policy, uh, broken promise rather, on superannuation will be followed by many more broken promises and more tactics to get their hands on the incomes of Australian workers through higher taxes. We saw the Treasurer uh, just last week desperately trying to keep his options open on other ways to hike taxes and plug his budget holes. He didn't even want to rule out capital gains tax on the family home. And yet, Less than an hour after that radio interview, we had the oh, less than an after, uh, hour after that interview, rather, we had the prime minister appearing on radio, clearing up the treasurer's mess, attempting to clarify exactly what was meant. We can see how desperate the government is to plug the holes in its budget. By the way, it wants to break its promise and legislate these tax increases straight away. If there is one thing we've learned over the years. Mr Deputy President, it is that Labor cannot be trusted with money. They will always try and get their hands on more money of hard more of the money that our hardworking Australians earn, and that is certainly what they are seeking to do with this most recent policy announcement. So, like I say, uh, another day in this place, another broken promise from the Labor government. I think Australians deserve more, Mr Acting Deputy President. Australians deserve a government that sticks to the commitments that it made at the election last year. Uh, and I recognise that during an election campaign, parties will always put uh, commitments to the public and will always seek to um, put their case to the public uh, in order to uh, gain election. And, and, and that's part of the contest of ideas. That's part of what having an election is all about, to enable people uh, to look at the ideas that are on um, offer from both political parties and make an informed decision. The Australian people made an informed decision based on the information that this government put on the record in May last year, and yet everything we have seen since, whether it's out in the community, whether it's in this place here, demonstrates time and time again that this government was willing to say whatever they like to get into get their. Uh, uh, be able to get access to the uh, government benches over here. They said whatever they like, and now since then all we have seen is broken promise after broken promise after broken promise. Australians, quite frankly, Mr. Acting Deputy, uh, Mr. Deputy President, rather deserve more. Hey, the President, I rise to make my contribution, and look, I honestly believe I, I think I'm in a parallel universe, and I, I don't like to go down the path of history lessons. But I think it's important for some of us that have been around in the workforce uh, for a little while. I was a recipient of the uh, the, um, the Hawke uh, Keating's uh, push to have workers to get superannuation. I remember the Accords. I remember being in wage negotiations in the 80s and 90s when we traded off our pay rises so we could get an increase in super. And I remember as a young union official. Uh, at that little transport company called TNT when we received superannuation. And may I say, Mr Deputy President, uh, it wasn't 11 per cent of our wages, it was $1.87 a week. And I remember saying to my union organiser and my fellow workers in the site, what are we going to do with $1.87? To which I was told, stick it in your bank account, think about it, in your superannuation account. And got, lo and behold, the whole idea was that we, we, the workers, would not be a burden, and when I say workers, I mean all workers, I'm not even a class warfare here, that we would not be a burden upon the taxpayers when we retire. I also remember being privileged to be with an employer that gave me an opportunity in later life at the Transport Workers Union where I could increase my superannuation through the benefits that were available through, I can't remember what they used to call it, but you could offset your taxation, put it into your super. And Fiona and I made that decision in the 90s that we wanted to up our super because we didn't want to be a burden on the taxpayers, but we, were the, we, were, we, we believed we were privileged enough to have good paying union jobs that we could afford to put a bit aside for super at the same time while putting our kids through school and while building a house. Now, Mr Deputy President, I have tried all my working life to look after my superannuation and I'm proud to say that I'm quite happy with how it's been going. But I've got to tell you, Mr Deputy President, it ain't nowhere near $3 million. 
And I've also got to tell you, Mr Deputy President, much to my sad, my, my hurt and heart, it ain't going to be anywhere near $3 million unless I win super, if I win lotto and happen to chuck a, a fair bit, a big chunk in. But it just baffles me. People out on the streets thinking about what is this mob over there going on about? Why are they looking after people or they're so concerned about people who have $3 million plus in their super? And can I say to all of those that have more, and even that one person who's got 500, 544 million, I'm jealous. I wish I had 544 million because I tell you what, I'd be able to pay an accountant a lot of money to tell me how I can get around it and do other things and start buying the kids luxury yachts and holiday homes and I don't know, places in Turak or wherever they live. But, Mr Deputy President, for crying out loud, they're still going to get access to 15 per cent tax on their super up to $3 million. Think about that. Think of all those people out there in Struggle Street. Think of all those people out there that have had to contend with rising inflation, which we all know in this building has meant there has been a huge impost and a cost to them on their housing payments. Think about the squeeze on our supply chains. Think about this, the price of diesel going through the roof. Guess who's paying for it? Not, not, not all the trucking companies, some of the smaller ones are. It's coming back through the supermarket lines. Think about that. Now, they don't stand up and fight and argue about the cost of living. They don't stand up and fight because of the mess that they left the Albanese government, the debts that they left us, and yet, for some strange, weird, out there reason, they want to protect, I don't know, they all donors, everyone who's got $3 million plus in their super. What could be the logical argument? I really, really would like to get into the heads of some of those on the crossbench, because I honestly think, oh, sorry, on the, on the opposition benches, because I honestly think that they must be totally baffled or absolutely embarrassed or just uh, uh, gobsmacked that their leader's going to charge them back into government by standing up for people that have more than $3 million. And when I say standing up for people with more than $3 million, they'll pay that extra 15 per cent tax on money above $3 million. If you listen to that side over there, you would think that we are putting our hands in the pockets of people who have more than three, three million dollars or more and taking it all off them in some massive great tax grab. For crying out loud, Senator Van, I'm looking forward to your contribution. I, I really am. I, I'm trying to give you an out. Because you're not all dodos over that side. You notice I did say not all of you. Some of you are pretty intelligent people. Some of you have built a good life because you've got out and done the hard yards, like some of us over this, or a lot of us over this side have done. But seriously, you think this is great economics? You think this is great politics while people are struggling with rising inflation, rising housing costs, rising supply chain costs, rising food costs, rising fuel costs? You think you're on the side of the angels? <laughs> Can't wait for the blue. Senator Van. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. And I thank my good friend Senator Stirl for reminding us of the Hawke-Keating years, where that Labor government took interest rates to 18 per cent, when their Treasurer Paul Keating said we went into a recession that we had to have. So when are we going to hear Dr Chalmers say we're having another recession that we had to have? We're, going to, we're seeing history repeat out itself with this government, although it looks more like the Whitlam government than it does the Hawke Keating government. And I also thank the Treasurer for reminding Australians that Labor will always go after their money. How can the Australian people trust anything this government says after, yet again, we're seeing another broken promise? They said before the election many, many times that they wouldn't make any changes to super. Well, it didn't take them long to change that, did they? And it's clear now that the Labor government do not see superannuation as a vehicle for Australians to support themselves in their retirement, but it's a piggy bank to bankroll their election campaigns. You know, this money, this $3 million, Senator Stirl said he put money aside, he super sacrificed. I almost guarantee you that most of those people with $3 million made decisions to, to sacrifice some of their salary and put it into superannuation because there was always a pact with the Australian people and the Australian governments that the rules for super would stay as they are and they could have some faith in how they invested. Then the Assistant Treasurer 
grotesquely referred to people's super as honey from a hive. It's truly a sick joke to think that people can go to work their entire lives, work hard, sacrifice some of their salary, save money, and then the Labor government looks at that money and instead of thinking, well, good on you, mate, well done, go enjoy your retirement, Stephen Jones looks at it and says, how much of that can I get my hands on? And this is not the first time for Assistant Minister Jones, who's been caught out trying to pull the, the wool over Australians' eyes over super changes. Let's not forget that within weeks of coming to government, one of Assistant Minister Jones' first acts was to direct the Treasury to look at how it could support industry super funds, get away with poor performance and mismanagement, trying to underdo the important transparency mechanisms that we put in place in government under the Your Future, Your Super legislation. Despite going to the election promising lower taxes and no change to super, this government have decided to make changes to super but by doubling the tax on those higher thresholds. And this is just a long list of election promises and lies that this government have made. Let's not forget the Prime Minister promised 97 times that he would reduce Australians' power bills by $275. Instead, he's delivered the most expensive average wholesale electricity on record. They promised cheaper mortgages, and almost every home-owning Australian knows that Labor outright lied on that one, with mortgages going through the roof after the ninth consecutive rate rise. And that is since May 2022, when the election was. They even promised to lower inflation. But in January, we saw inflation at 7.8 per cent for the December, which is the highest it's been since 1990. They also promised higher wages, but we've just seen the biggest drop in real wages in recorded history. So we know that this government will not deliver on its promises. We know that this government will change its mind on things. So every Australian out there listening to this must remember that when they're saying it's only 0.5 per cent of uh, people who hold super funds and it's only a modest increase, modest, my backside, 50 per cent increase is not modest in anyone's books. When they say they're not going to change this, you cannot believe them. You cannot believe a word that comes out of their mouth. They will lower that threshold. They're telling you now that they won't, but mark my words, they will. They'll lower that threshold. They'll increase that, that concessional rate such that Australians who have worked hard, saved hard, are going to be paying more and more and more under this government. They lie. Do not trust them. Senator Grogan. Thank you. Well, it's fascinating listening to this debate um, that has raged through question time. And I'm left scratching my head somewhat at the deep and abiding concern for a modest change in the amount of tax that people pay if they have more than $3 million in their account. Yeah, come on. Um, so let's just be clear. What is this about? The change that we are putting forward is about a very modest change to ensure that the superannuation system does what it is supposed to do. And that is not about having a tax offset for people with deep wealth to use for whatever inheritance or further uh, opportunities that they might be using them for. This is about changing it. There are many other financial vehicles that they can use. But $3 million in your super account, that's where the tax breaks reduce. Not stop, but reduce. Let's be clear, the highest tax threshold is 47, and this is still 30 per cent if you're over 3 million. So all of this hoo-ha and beat up is just completely ridiculous. Completely ridiculous. Particularly when we look at the kind of legacy that's been left by this government the legacy of rorts, waste, a trillion dollars in debt, 
not to mention the laundry list of terminating measures hidden in the budget out into the future that the people of this country know nothing about. Yet you want to protect the millionaires. Well done. Good call. Excellent. You opposed a $1 pay rise a year for the lowest paid workers. But no, no, let's go in and fight for the millionaires. Ignore the people who are struggling. You've got this ridiculous narrative about how much you care about cost of living, yet nothing you did when you were in government, nothing the coalition while in government did to look after those people who are now feeling the cost of living pressures the most. So it's laughable to hear you out there protecting the millionaires on one hand. Oh no, our friends with $3 million can't possibly cope. Well, I don't think so. This is a sensible change. Superannuation was built in this country to enable people to have a dignified retirement. It's not the investment vehicle for your next purchase. It's not the investment vehicle for your deep inheritance. Go and find another investment vehicle. This is a small number of people with a large amount of money and good on them. Don't begrudge them a penny of it. Not a penny of it. If they've worked hard for that, well done. But no, they should not get a tax break from the Australian people in which to allow them to keep more than $3 million in their superannuation account without paying a more reasonable amount of tax for it. So if we can just be clear, because some of the ridiculous conversations I've heard roll out through this, um, through this period, it is 15 per cent tax for every penny under $3 million. And it is 30 per cent tax for the pennies over three million. So let's just be really clear about that. No one's robbing anyone. And the beat up and the scare campaign, obviously you're very excited about that on the opposition benches over there, but it is completely ridiculous. Yes, cost of living is a critical issue in this country at the moment. It is the thing that, that we over on this side the Albanese Labor government are deeply, deeply concerned about and working very hard for those solutions. But that's all right. You over there, the coalition, you keep fighting for the millionaires while, on the other hand, just chatting about cost of living. Well, it's easy now you're in opposition because you did absolutely nothing, nothing when you were in government. So you should be ashamed of yourselves for the behaviour over this last couple of hours. It's been ridiculous to listen to, totally ridiculous. Thank you. Senator Canavan. Thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. Well, this uh, question time showed quite clearly that the government has not been up front with the Australian people over the past week. Obviously, the talking points went out this morning that they wanted to use the word modest uh, an immodest amount of time during question time it was modest this, modest that, modest everything, until, until uh, the finance minister was a little too immodest and revealed, in fact, uh, that the amount of people that are going to be hit by Labor's doubling of the super tax is 20 times what they've been telling Australians over the past week. Over the past week, this government has been trying to tell fibs to the Australian people that only half per cent of you, only half per cent, don't worry about it, less than a per cent of people are going to be impacted by our tax grab that we didn't, that is directly against what we promised you only a year ago at the election, but only, only those half per cent, you don't have to worry about that. Well, actually, it was revealed today that uh, because of inflation, in fact, 10 per cent of Australians will pay this tax over their lifetime. That's what this tax is a lifetime tax. It's about taxing you for saving for your own retirement. So it's not really about how many people have more than $3 million today. That doesn't raise a lot of money because there's not a lot of them. This is actually about taxing you in the future, taxing your future self, the self that you are trying to work hard for and uh, save for so you can have a dignified retirement. Now, the government's refusal to index that $3 million shows that, this is, that there is a hidden secret agenda here. The hidden agenda is to tax you more so that they can spend more, waste more on the various things uh, that the Labor Party with their friends in the Greens love to waste your money on. 
because 10 per cent of people is a lot of Australians. It might be you. You don't know how your life's going to turn out. You might work hard and, and do well for yourself. You could very easily be, look around at yourselves, that only one in 10 of you are going to be hit by this tax. This is the decimation of the Roman Legion. One in 10 will be hit by this tax, thanks to the revelation of this secret modelling. Because not only has the big government been keeping this secret from the Australian people, they have actual modelling we know now that they told no one about. In fact, I've been, I've been uh, uh, messaging some journalists uh, just now, and the journalists have been asking the government for these figures over the last few days. They've been asking for them, but surprise, surprise, no one has given them to them. Well, now we know there is a bunch of secret modelling there, and I would have thought this place in this house, in this chamber, we should be holding the government to account and getting the full details of that secret modelling from the government. We need all of those details, not just the 10 per cent. We know 10 per cent are going to be hit, but then, then, then after being a little immodest, the finance minister went back to being uh, modest again and she wouldn't tell us how much, okay, this modelling, how much extra tax over their lifetime will those 10 per cent of Australians have to pay. That's surely in their modelling. It's not that hard to work out. And, and so where is that figure? We, need, we should, as a Senate, demand those figures before signing off on these changes. All of this modelling should be revealed. Because it doesn't take too hard to do some sums. If you do some sums, do some rough sums, say there's a 30-year-old there today, out there today with 200000 bucks in super, and if they're only earning 100000 a year, which is just over the average full-time wage now, $100,000 a year, and they make their normal mandated contributions, uh, their, their salary goes up with inflation, and, and they make they make uh, uh, the average returns on super, they will be over the $3 million threshold by the time of their retirement. That's someone on an average wage will be over the $3 million threshold if they start off with a bit of money. That's the power of compound interest. And if they do end up in this category, they will end up over their lifetime, if they, they live to just over 80 years old, average age once you retire, they will, they will pay an extra $700,000 in tax in their lifetime, thanks to this change. $700,000 of tax, because this tax hits you every year. It, it, it hurts the growth of your fund. It's a tax on saving, a tax on capital accumulation. It's the worst kind of tax because it hurts our overall economic strength. And, and uh, so if the government is going to be fair dinkum with Australians, it should now do two things at a minimum. If they're going to be fair dinkum, they broke, already broke a promise to the Australian people, but to be fair dinkum, they should release this modelling so we all know, people know how much extra tax they're due uh, thanks to this broken promise from this government. And, and, and the government should commit to index this threshold because if they really only want to hit half percent of Australians, just index the threshold and that argument will be taken away from me. The fact they're not doing that shows that they're actually not fair dinkum about this change. Senator Roberts, uh, we still have uh, Senator Rice. We still have 30 seconds to go before I put the motion. I assume you're sharing. No, I want to speak. So, Senator Roberts, are you on this one? No, I'm. I'm seeking the next spot. He's finished. Oh, I haven't. Put, I haven't put the question. It's a, diff it's a different question, Senator Roberts. I have to put. The, I have to put the question to the chamber. So I put, I put the question uh, to the motion moved by Senator Chan uh, Chandler. Those who the question say aye, against no, the ayes have it. Now, it's tradition, it has been in the past, the call gets given to the Greens, because it's their question, Senator, Senator Roberts. No. To the crossbench. No. Senator Roberts was on his feet first. But I'm, I'm, I'm happy, I'm to, in sit the hands down, I'm the happy to sit down with the Greens and negotiate a roster yeah, in the I would prefer, I I would really prefer that the whips, because the, the practice has been, since I've been chair, has been that the, the, the party that asks the question generally, not that it's, it's not about, thank you for the commentary, Senator Canavan. So uh, today, today I'll give the call to the, to the Greens because they ask the questions and I'll see if you can negotiate something. If not, well then we'll, I will reflect on that and discuss the behaviours with the uh, discuss going forward with the whips. Well I'm not I'm not conversant with what conversations I've had with the whips, so I'll give the call to Senator Rice and I'm happy to take remonstrations outside of the cha chamber. Thanks President. I seek to take note of Senator Gallagher's answer to my question. Um, it was very good to hear that the government has committed to funding the increase in wages for aged care workers by the 15 per cent as the Fair Work Commission told them they needed to in full in the coming financial year. This 15 per cent increase in the coming financial year is the least 
that the government needed to commit to. And, you know, we were outraged at their attempts to spread it out over two years. I'm glad that they have come to their senses and have committed to funding it over one year. Aged care workers are some of the most poorly paid workers in the country. They are generally women and that they are generally inc struggling incredibly with the cost of living. That 15 per cent increase is going to actually make it slightly more possible that they'll be able to pay the rent, to put food on the table, to pay for their own bills whilst working incredibly hard, caring for some of the most vulnerable people in our society. And increasing the wages and conditions of aged care workers is fundamental to increasing the quality of care for our older Australians, whether they are in residential care, whether they are receiving home care. We know that when aged care workers are paid better, when they've got better conditions, when they are not being rushed off their feet, that older Australians get better care. And that's what all Australians want to see. They want to know that our, age, that our older people in residential care who are being cared for in home care are actually getting the care that they deserve, having worked all of their lives so hard and now reliant on other people to help care for them. It's the least that we can do. Um, but we also know that we're in a situation that, yep, we are paying those, we have now got this commitment for that 15 per cent increase. But aged care providers are losing, on average, $28 per resident per day. And we know that the health sector union, they called not just for a 15 per cent increase, but a 25 per cent increase to bring the wages of aged care workers up to a reasonable level. And by bringing them up to that level, it means that more people are going to feel that they can afford to work in aged care. There are so many people. I know the home care workers that help care for my mum. There's a churn of workers. And for a lot of them, it's not because they don't like the work, but because the wages that they have been paid are so low that they can't afford to keep working in that work. And that they will keep their eyes open for anything that will pay them more money, and then they will go. And they, you know, so the, the churn of workers People then don't have the continuity of care. They don't get the care that they need as you get a new worker coming in every month. I heard Senator Gallagher say that you know, the government needed to be fiscally responsible, that she was working very hard to try and find room in the budget so that we could pay the money that was needed to improve the conditions in aged care. The Royal Commission, they were very clear that in order to fund all of their recommendations now two years ago, there was about an extra $10 billion a year that was needed. And so we heard you know, Senator Gallagher wringing her hand saying, yep, yeah, we're doing our best to try and find where we can find money in the budget. Well, there's an easy answer for the government. Here they are, trying to find out how they can wring little bits more out of the budget to try and support some of the lowest paid workers in the country to support older Australians, we know $10 billion a year is needed. There's an easy answer. The stage three tax cuts, the Morrison government stage three tax cuts are going to cost the budget bottom line $254 billion over the next 10 years, a quarter of a trillion dollars, on average $25 billion a year. It's actually quite easy to find that extra $10 billion and have change left over for all sorts of other things, for investing in, in affordable housing, for increasing income support. Abandon the stage three tax cuts. It's the obvious thing to do. Yes, the other side, they will scream and carry on like they have been doing about the minuscule changes that you're currently making to super tax concessions. But we know that the average Australian will thank you for it. Abandon the stage three tax cuts, which are going to mean billions of dollars going to the ultra wealthy to billionaires, to millionaires, people have already got so much, and instead invest that money where it's needed in improving wages and conditions for low-paid workers Thank and you, increasing Senator the— I put, I put the question. Those of the questions say aye, against, no. The ayes have it. Senator Roberts says 30 seconds remaining that hasn't been used. Would you like to move a motion to take note? Yes, I would, Chair. Please Thank go. You. 
The Labor Party thinks it's easy to just fob off this debate about broken political promises. This is about something far bigger. This is about the future of our country and this very parliament. We have got people dying in their thousands from the injections, and it has not been passed, not been approved by United States authorities, bypassed by the Department of Defence. So what we want is a proper, fair, royal commission into the COVID injections uh, and Senator, the whole treatment of COVID. Uh, Senator Roberts, which question were you taking note of, moving to take note of? Number six. Number six, uh, you've moved that. I put the question. Those are the questions say aye, against, no, the ayes have it.